All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Isaacson, and I'm going to talk to you today about what's coming in the next couple versions of C++. So what we're going to do, I'm going to spend about five minutes just giving you a whirlwind overview of what made it into 17, what's looking like it's going to be there in 20, and then I'm going to deep dive into three features that I thought were particularly cool. So two of them you're going to be able to take home and use today in C++14. You can use a version of StringView. You can use a version of if const expr that you can take home and use today. And then I would just want to spend a little bit of time kind of like a, as a brain exercise, mostly because I think it's fun, and talk about operator dot and the powers that that's going to give us. So with that, let's start with what made it into C++17. So file system TS. And TS, by the way, is just a group of papers. It's a group of features that were sent together to the standard all at once. So file system TS is things like file permissions, does a file exist, grouping paths together. Uh, we've got special math. So this is Legendre polynomials, Bessel functions. If you need this stuff, I bet you probably already knew it was in there. Parallelism. This is new overloads of the entire algorithm header, but you can now say run in parallel, run vectorized. We've got if const expr, I'll get to that. Fall through, uh, switch statements. Either when you've got a case you want to break or you want to fall through to the next one. This is an annotation that says, yeah, I really did mean to do that. No discard, another annotation, another silly bug that it helps you prevent. I once spent a full day on a really nasty bug. I was maintaining somebody else's code, and there was a lock guard. And that lock guard was never given a name. So we instantiated a lock guard, we destroyed the lock guard, and then we had the thing that was supposed to be the critical section. Whole day. No discard. You annotate your lock guard. You say, hey, somebody should probably hold on to that for more than just the duration of a single statement, and the compiler is going to make sure you do exactly that. We've got logical operators for your type trait. So uh, conjunction, put a bunch of things and and them at compile time. We've got polymorphic allocators, which I'll be honest, I know nothing about. Uh, we killed the throw clause at the latest standards meeting. So throw no longer exists, long live, no accept. We've got type deduction on constructors. So gone are the days of make pair. We no longer need something like make pair for the sole purpose of deducing the types. It'll just work. It'll figure out what you meant, deduce it for you. Now, by contrast, this one's subtle. Make shared, still important. Make shared is still important because it changes the way it allocates things. It can save you an allocation if you use make shared as opposed to using the constructor. Those kinds of benefits of using a function as opposed to the constructor itself still exist after this change. We've also got a stronger evaluation order for certain operations. So previously it was not defined whether A or B would be evaluated first in the expression A dot foo parentheses B. Now you're guaranteed that A happens first. This is nice when you're talking about things like future.then. Structured bindings. Uh, this one I am irrationally excited about. And the thing that makes me so excited about this was a slide from Yarna's keynote. And that was the for loop over standard map, where instead of having to get a pair out and do pair.first, pair.second, we could now say key value. Or better yet, if it's a phone book, you can say name and phone number. How cool is that? <laughs> Who else has that been bothering forever? <laughs> yeah. All right. Then we've got the library of fundamentals TS. And what's below it is just kind of all the different things that are in. So quickly, you can negate stuff. There's string view, which I'm going to talk about. Any is I hold any type in the entire language, just anything. Whereas variant is a different kind of variant where you say, here's a template list of things that this might be. And it can only be those things. Optional, either you have it or you don't. Shared pointer is going to now work nicely with arrays the same way unique pointer does. Uh, uncaught exceptions about a portable, correct implementation of scope guards. Run this if and only if an exception was thrown. Uh, kind of arcane. I wouldn't worry too much about that. And the last two are about taking an ar a tuple full of arguments and calling a function with that. So there it is. Super fast, maybe boring. This is C17. Woohoo. <laughs> All right, C20. There's probably a lot of stuff on this list that you wish was on that last slide. Uh, chief among them for me are ranges, modules, and concepts. 
And just a quick explanation of why we did not get those. What's going on there? How is the standardization process going? My understanding, and I could be wrong, there are people in the audience who know better, is that the way the standardization process is, has been going on is they're still learning the best way to ship the standard. And prior to C++11, you have a, a train. And the way that they did it is they said, we have this list of features we want, these passengers, and they all need to be on board before we ship. And so we got delayed, and it got delayed, and it got delayed. And nowadays, things are a little different. It's the train is going to leave on time every three years. Every three years, you're probably going to get a new version of C++. Whatever makes it, makes it. And this, this time, we didn't get a lot of the stuff we wanted. That's OK. Three years isn't that long. And what's more, you can use modules today. You can download a version of the compiler that already has it. You can test it today. I'm told that in code bases where it has been tested, they see a 2x reduction in their compile time today. You can do that. No problem. So, okay, we have this train model. I have explained that. Part of what's going on here is we also have a pipeline. They've been adding these papers, these groups of papers, these TSs to a pipeline, and it's slowly been filling up, slowly been filling up, and so far we haven't seen things really start spilling out the other side very frequently. And so that pipeline is just continuing to be filled up. C++14 happened, new stuff went in, old stuff came out, and I think we're going to hit a steady state where we have good, even releases, probably starting with 20. There's a huge list of things that I think are going to come due. Uh, concurrent CTS. This is, uh, sorry, it's actually slipping my mind. It might be uh, executors. No, that's parallelism v2. I forget. Transactional memory. So different primitives to work with concurrency. We've got concepts. This is a way of saying my function will only accept types that have these powers. And it gives you better error messages if those types do not. Ranges are going to be awesome. Um, I, I gave a tech talk earlier this week, and I gave it uh, back in Oslo much earlier this year. It's called the set of natural code. And in there, I describe the fundamental differences between iterators and ranges. And I, I wouldn't say it's a requirement for, for these things, but the things I'm most excited about is that you can write lazy algorithms or optionally say, I would like this to be greedy. And pipeline different things to each other. Imagine you have a single line that says, I would like to start with a vector of things, filter just the even numbers out, then turn it in reverse order, and show me a view of it that's, the, that's sorted. That's the kind of thing that you'll be able to do in the future without any O of n memory operations. It's just a way of looking at the original data. That's awesome. Networking, TCP, UDP, IP, boost ASIO. Uh, we've got lib fundamentals too, which has fun things in there like, I would like to print a vector comma separated. Uh, we've got coroutines, we've got numerics, all these extra things on there. It's going to be great. C++ 20. All right. So ends the boring part of the talk. Does anyone have questions? I'll answer to the best of my ability before we move on to some deep dives. Great. All right. Let's talk about strings. There's a bug on this slide, and this bug has been around since the beginning. It's been around since C++ 98. Show of hands, who sees the bug? We've got two globals here. Both of them are strings. And we initialize them. Ringing any bells? Anyone? Yeah, hand in the front. Say again? We're missing include guards. That is a bug, and it's not the one I meant. Good call. I see a hand over there. Initialization order. That is exactly it. And there's a fancy name for this. It is the static initialization order fiasco. And if I break that down word by word, hopefully it'll help. So static. We're talking about globals here. K-bar, k k-foo, k these are my globals. Initialization, that first value that we pop in. And what's more, we're talking about things that get initialized in this special window, this window between when your program starts running and when your main function starts. That time slice is where a lot of your globals get initialized. And then we hit the third word, which is order. So static initialization order. It is not specified, not guaranteed by the standard when you have globals in different compilation units, different CPP files in this case. Which one of them will get its value first? So k bar might be initialized to kfoo before kfoo has ever been assigned to the string literal. And if that happens, you've got a fiasco. You've got 
a bug in your program. So classic bug, been around for a long time. Good news. We can detect this automatically, and we've got best practices to avoid this. Maybe you've been scratching your head thinking, wait a second, that doesn't look like what I do with string literals. Now, to detect this automatically, there's a tool out there, Address Sanitizer. And if you just change your compilation to add one more flag, you add dash sanitize address, or maybe it's f sanitize equals address, and you export the ASAN options at the bottom there, it will point out every single one of these bugs in your, in your program. And you don't even need to run it to completion, only till your main function actually starts. Now, this is nice because, as I said, this order isn't guaranteed by the standard, and it changes when you upgrade your compiler. So if you change from one version of Clang or one version of GCC to a slightly newer one, this might break. Where it once did work, now it might not. And so it gets in the way of these free wins that you would otherwise have by saying, oh, let me just get a new version of the compiler with a better optimizer. So run ASAN over your code base, find all these bugs, fix it, thank me later. But we've also got best practices. This is maybe what you're more used to. The easiest, quickest answer to this in to, to, for current C++ today, change to C strings. Super simple, find, replace. The reason why this works is instead of initializing kfu and kbar in that window between when the program starts and when the main function starts, kfu can be initialized sooner. So string literals, they go straight into the static section of your object files, always. This example and the previous one. The difference is kfu is a primitive type now. And primitive types, the compiler knows how to initialize at compile time. It, the compiler can say, hey, kfu, I'm just going to make it so that when the program loads, before we even run it, kfu is pointed at that particular spot in the static section. And now it doesn't matter you know, what kbar does, because one of them has been initialized before the program even started executing. Problem solved. This is the classic way we dealt with this. Take us to C++17, income string view. Now, the first thing to know about string view is that it has a lot of the same interface as standard string. It has begin, it has end, it has size. So it's friendly, it'll work with your algorithms, it knows its length, it's harder to write a heart bleed bug with it. The second thing you have to know about a string view is what it actually is. It is a pointer and a length. That's all it is. So I want to make an analogy. I would say a standard string is kind of close to a unique pointer. A unique pointer says, I uniquely control the lifetime of this object. A unique pointer is responsible for determining when the memory is cleaned up. When it falls out of scope, the memory is freed. Same thing with the standard string. The standard string allocates the memory, it controls the lifetime. When it falls out of scope, the memory goes away. A raw pointer in a modern code base means I have a view of that data. It's not a weak pointer. It doesn't even know if the data is still there. It's I was told that there's some data over there. Let me look at it. It's a view. That's what string view is. It's I think there's a string over there. Let me look at it. All right. So I've got that. I can also initialize a string view with a string literal. It'll just do an O of n, str len call, figure out what the length is, and provide a view of that. So string view kind of bridges both of these, C strings and standard strings. Now, the nice thing about it being a view is that it doesn't have to allocate anything. The constructor is dirt simple. If you pass it a C string, it just calls str len and saves the pointer and saves the length. And the compiler can do that at compile time. That constructor can be const expr. And because it's const expr, the compiler can do it during compilation. And for the same reason the C strings were OK, this is OK. It just stores it away at compile time. It does the initialization at compile time. One thing unusual about this slide that's kind of different, maybe it's nagging at you. I only show one compilation unit here. There's a reason for that. I have to initialize this with const expr to tell the compiler, please initialize this at compile time. And when I use const expr, to initialize something, I must provide a value. There is no option. I must give it the value immediately in the header file. No more can I do, hey, x turn, there's this thing, and then give it the value later. It must be done all at once. And as a consequence of this, each compilation unit actually gets its own version of kfu. They just all point at the same string literal. If you took the address of kfu, that would be different. It's subtle, it's weird, I doubt you'll ever find a reason that that causes problems. But 
That's what's going on. If I did have a second compilation unit, if I did use KFU in that, there's no bug. I've tested. It works. All right. I've shown you just kind of a weak argument so far. We can use the string view thing. It also has no bugs. Great. Uh, it has the standard API. All right. Where's the real win? The real win here is in performance. So if you've got functions in your code base that take const string reference, and I work at Facebook, and a while ago, we did a little bit of math. We found out that the most included header at Facebook is string, by far. And so if you imagine, if almost all of your files are using strings, how many function signatures might you have with const string reference? Well, that is a non-owning view of a string. That is a string view in old speak, in pre-C++17 talk. So find replace. This is one of the only times that find replace your entire code base, const string reference to string view, will give you a perf win. And here's why. For these globals, if I pass one of these globals, and let's say it was a C string, let's say we were doing it the old way, and we passed it to const string reference, I am required to instantiate a standard string. That means there's an O of n call to sterlen. That means there's a call to the allocator. That means there's an O of n copy. Contrast that with a string view. Now, if my function accepts a string view, and I had a string view before, or even if I didn't, but if I had a string view before, it just goes. It just works. There's no, there's no O of n operations. There's no allocations. But if I did have a C string, fine. It's an O of n sterlen call. Again, no copies. And it gets even better. There's another perf win here. And that is. Uh, that I can also save another O of on operation in a slightly different case. And for the life of me, it is escaping me. So we're going to move on. I promise you, though, there's a little bit of another perf win there. Find replace. My apologies. Now there's another win. It's safety. Show of hands, who's been bitten by the bug? You take two C strings, and you compare them for equality, and you're thinking, oh, I'm comparing the stuff inside. Anyone? Yeah, um, it's easy enough to write. It's, I've got these two pointers, let me compare them for equality. And maybe that actually does what you want some of the time, by happenstance, if you've got two versions of a string literal. But it might bite you. Standard string, string view, operator overloads, they save you from that kind of mistake. So there's a little bit of a safety win here, too, in just having a better API. So here's the summary. Here's why string view is so great. It's just a way of s expressing the idea, I have something that is a view of the data. It does not own the data. It does not participate in the ownership. We've got performance. If I pass in one of these globals, I no longer need to perform an allocation. That's pretty good. And it's self-documenting. It says, I do not own this. And it's got the standard API on it. It's got begin. It's got end. It's got size. It's got all these wonderful things. Now, there is a catch. I said, go ahead. Find replace. You'll get a win. There's a tiny little caveat to that, and that is if you ever ended up in the situation where you had a standard string, you passed it to a function that took a string view, and then you were forced to call a function that took a const string reference, you'd have a copy now that you wouldn't have before if you'd just gone const string reference the whole way down. Now, why would that happen? Well, third-party code. And the most egregious, most nagging one of these that I've seen so far the one that hurts, the one that I want to write a paper to fix, is in unordered map. If you've got an unordered map of standard string, there is no way in C++17 to look up into that map with a string view. You'll be forced to convert it to a const string reference. You'll be forced to perform the allocation. So one thing to watch out for, something to be fixed. All right, I want to move on and talk about operator dot. Here's where things are going to get fun. So this is a brain exercise. This is just to talk about something that I think is interesting. And to start this, I want to tell you about operator dot and what it does and how it works. So my understanding is if I want to make an int, or I want to make a type that behaves exactly like an int, I want it to have all the same operators. I want it to do everything that an int does. In C++ 98, I can do that. I can overload all those operators, and I'll end up with a list that's a kilometer long. It'll be this very painful process. I'll have to enumerate everything. 
In C++ 7, or sorry, in possibly C++ 20, we might get operator dot. And operator dot offers a better path. So I implement this one operator, and over here I have this proxy. I can set it equal to five. I can add to it with plus equal. I can print it out. All these operations happen for free. And the reason they happen is if I look at the plus equal, what the compiler is going to say is, does int proxy have support for plus equal? Does it overload that operator? And if it does, it would call it. But in this case, it doesn't. And so it goes, let me call operator dot, get the result of that, and try the operation on that instead. So that's what we're doing. Now, if you're wondering, where's the dot? Where's the dot of my example on the right-hand side? Well, there's a term that happens when we talk about languages and compilers, and it's called lowering. It's where we take a piece of syntactic sugar and rewrite it into something that the compiler already understands. And in this case, plus equal can be rewritten as x dot operator plus equal of 5. So there's the dot. And we said, hey, int proxy doesn't have that operation. Call operator dot. Do it on that instead. That's not super interesting, though. I want to add to that. I want my int, my int proxy, to have a two-string method, because wouldn't that be nice? So I just add a function, and I can call it. And the lookup rules for this are the same. I say x.toString, and it asks, int proxy, do you have a two-string method? And it does, and we call it. Operator dot is never invoked on that line. So these are the basics. Show of thumbs. How are people feeling about how they understand this so far? Good. Great. So I saw this feature, and I said, how can I abuse this, as any good C++ programmer would do? How can I take this and bump it up and do something that wasn't expected, that wasn't intended? What would be cool and useful? And I thought, let's do contracts. Now, contracts are also being considered for standardization. There are some proposals out there. I don't know when they're expected to land. But if, for whatever reason, we get this first, you can implement them yourselves. My goal is to have something that behaves like an integer but has a value restriction. It can only be between 0 and 100. Anything else, throw an exception, log an error, fire an assertion, some error handling strategy. So setting it to 5, that's OK. Adding 5 to it, now it's 10. We're still good. Assign it to 1,000, though, and things should explode. That's the goal. But So the first thing we need is to make it behave like an int. That's the baseline behavior. So operator dot, there it is. And it turns out that implementing the condition I asked for, the post condition I wanted, is very hard. So let's talk preconditions first. Let's build up to it. Let's solve an easier problem. If I wanted to check that condition, if I wanted to check my invariant before I did an operation as opposed to after, where would the code go? Does anyone have a suggestion for where I would check a precondition? Yes? Before I return the value. So operator dot gets called, and the result gets returned, and then I forward the operation. Then I do the plus equal, after operator dot is over. So in the body of operator dot, great place to put a precondition, great place to throw an exception, say, hey, you made a mistake. All right, let's do something a little different. Let's say I want to check the invariant at the end of life of my object, and the object falls out of scope. Where would I put that condition? Where does that go? Yeah. Say again? Absolutely. We make a destructor, we check the condition in the destructor. Now take that one level further and you get post conditions. And let me explain. This is the order I want you to pay attention to things in. First off, number one, x plus equal 5. We have x dot operator plus equal of 5. And we say, OK, bounded int doesn't have plus equal. So call the operator dot. That gives us an impl. That's the thing on the right. Now, impl also doesn't have plus equal. So we call its operator dot. It's a chain. We get out an int reference. That does have plus equal. And then we would perform the operation. So that's the first thing that you need to see. The second thing is that we have a bunch of references here. I have int val in bounded int. And when I pass that to impl, when I pass that to the constructor of impl in bound, bounded int operator dot, it receives that by reference. And it stores a reference to it as a data member. Then the operator dot from impl returns that by reference. So ultimately, when we do that plus equal, we are affecting int val. That is the thing that is changing. 
the last thing to know, the last thing to see, is we're doing this creation of a temporary impl struct. So I do x dot operator plus equal five, and that creates an impl because I create an impl in operator dot. I call impl's operator dot. I perform the operation, and then the statement is over. And at that point, impl destructs. The end of the statement means that impl will destruct, and when it destructs, we check the post condition, and I print out, hey, you made a mistake. And there it is. That's post conditions. And by the way, the reason I'm printing out or logging an error instead of throwing one is because that's a destructor. And if I threw, things wouldn't be so nice. You could also use an assertion. OK, so post conditions. I think this is pretty cool. But there's a small little thing that bothers me. And that is, if I do run that x equals 1,000 line, it will log. It will print out that I made an error. After that line, if I printed x, if I added another line and I just printed it out, it would be 1,000. That thing I didn't want to happen would now be committed into the value forevermore. Let's make it transactional. Let's make it roll back if ever that post condition has been violated. And the change for that is pretty simple. When I pass val into impl, I store two versions now. I store it by reference in a data member, and I store a copy of it. And the operator dot of impl returns the copy by reference. It is a temporary that I will perform the operation on. And in the destructor, I say, did that copy, did the, the thing that I performed the operation on, stay within my bounds? And if it did, commit it. Save it back into val. And otherwise, discard it. Just roll back the transaction. So there it is. Little brain exercise with operator dot. Now, there's some things that I'll just talk about briefly, some things that I'll describe but not show. Operator dot lets you do a bunch of things that we really can't do right now, uh, or better, more efficient ways to do them. So smart references. We can have a shared ref, a unique ref, in addition to a unique pointer. We can do pimple. So pimple, you separate out your interface and your implementation so that when you change your implementation, your customers don't need to recompile. Well, part of that process is you need to duplicate all of your interface functions in two places. Not anymore. Operator dot just says, forward on through. Figures it out. This is really nice. I gave another talk uh, called uh, Fundamentals of Type-Dependent Code Reuse, which you can look up. And in that one, I show yet another use of operator dot for mixins, for, for proxies and mixins. So if you're interested in that, if you like this kind of brain exercise, go on and find it. Now, this code is untested, by the way, because there's no compiler that does this right now. So take everything you see with a grain of salt. We'll get something like this. Maybe not it itself. You might be wondering at this point, what's the difference between operator dot and inheritance? Well, there's a few things. We can extend primitives. We can extend things that are final. There's no way to block returning operator dot from something. There's no notion of protected. And hey, look, updates. All right, there's no notion of protected. So I can't do what you can do with a base class. A base class can say, hey, here's a virtual function. It's abstract. And then the base class can call that virtual function somewhere else, trusting that the derived type will implement it. Can't do that with operator dot. The wrapped type knows nothing about the wrapper. And that's why you can't do things like uh, the NVI pattern. So it just knows nothing about it. It is ignorant to the fact that it is being wrapped. Last topic today, compile time branching. We've been able to do this for a long time. In C++ 98, we had partial template specialization. Now, I'm going to show you an example from the standard library, something called default delete. And this is an implementation detail of unique pointer. Now, unique pointer, there's two ways you can make a unique pointer. You can say unique pointer of int, and you can say unique pointer of int subscript. One for a single instance of an integer, one for an array. Now, th the big concern is, how do you clean that up? Because that's the whole purpose of a unique pointer. You need to know which deletion operator to use. If you use the wrong one, you've got undefined behavior. So there's this nifty little thing in there, and it says, OK, I'm going to figure out which one you want. If you give me a unique pointer of int, or default delete of just int, we'll go to the default case, the top case. And then we've got a specialization where we say, if, if the type you gave me, if t matches the pattern subscript, if it looks like it's an array, 
use the array deletion operator. That's a branch. We said, if it looks like this, do one thing or another. That's a branch at compile time. Now, why the second set of templates? Why the U? Uh, long story short, if I plugged in int there and it matched the pattern int subscript, and I just said t star in the bottom, then what we'd actually have is int subscript star. So I need a second set of templates or any of another uh, few solutions to make that problem disappear. All right, this is magic. You shouldn't have to know it. This is hard. It's arcane. It's a branch that does not look like a branch. It's not the thing that we teach people in their intro programming course. So rewrite it. This code is just as good with an if statement. This has a branch. It looks like a branch. It's the thing that we taught people early on. There's some other magic in there but one piece of the magic puzzle is gone. I say, is this an array? If it is, do the array thing. Otherwise, do the single instance deletion operator. This is great. Now, let's do something a little bit more complicated. I want to write a compile time const expr conjunction function. Say that 10 times fast. It takes any number of bools, and it just does the logical and and operator on them. So true is trivially true. False is trivially false. If you give me a list of arguments and any of them are false, I'm going to give you false. And if you give me a list where everything's true, I'll return true. That is what we would like to implement. And again, I can do this in old style C++. I can do this with C++11. And I have a base case and a pseudo recursive case. My base case says if you give me just one Boolean, I'll return it trivially. That is the answer. And if you give me more than one bool, if you give me a parameter pack of zero or more things in addition to that first bool, then I'll say, OK, check the first one. If it's false, we can short circuit. And otherwise, pseudo recurse, expand the parameter pack, try again until we get down to our base case. And again, this is wizardry. You shouldn't have to know it. It's special. It's a branch that, ch that says, are we in the base case? If so, do a special thing. This is an if statement, but it doesn't look like an if statement. It's something special that you had to learn that probably you know because you're at meeting C++, but your colleagues probably don't want to know. And we can do better. So in C++ 17, if const expr solves this problem. It makes if statements look like if statements. I rewrite this. I say, what is the size of my parameter pack? If there is more than one bool, recurse. And if the size of my parameter pack is 0, if there's only one bool that you've given me, just return that. So it's a base case expressed as an if statement. It reads like an if statement. This is more natural. This is more expressive. It's easier for new people to get in. And you might wonder, OK, I showed you one example where I could just use a normal if statement. Now I've got if const expr. What's the deal here? Why if const expr? What's the difference where this one needs const expr, the other one doesn't? And to show you that, I'm going to give you an example. So if I call this with just true, that's the only argument. When I call this, bool b is the true, and rest is an empty parameter pack. There's nothing in it. Now, the else side of my if statement is totally valid and fine. The if side, the b and and, like all that stuff, is good. But then we get to conjunction, and we try and forward this empty parameter pack. And there is no overload of conjunction that accepts zero bools. And because of that reason, the if statement, a normal if statement here without const expr, doesn't work. Because both sides of an if statement have to be instantiable. They have to both be valid code. They have to be semantically correct. And because my parameter pack is empty, I cannot call conjunction like that. Now, I could add an overload. I could add an overload where it takes zero arguments. But we're back to wizardry. So this is a non-starter. Doesn't work. Now, maybe you've been paying a lot of attention. Maybe you know that in C++17, we also get fold expressions. Fold expressions are an even easier way to do this. I can just say, here's the first bool, and, and, expand the parameter pack. Compiler, you know what to do. That works. That's coming. It's awesome. It's going to make a lot of people uh, very happy. Now, why did I show you something where we went from arcane template branching with partial template specialization to const expr if to, oh, by the way, it's a one-liner? Well, it's only a one-liner for this example that fits on a slide. 
If you want to do something more complicated, if you want to write a compile time linear search, I give you a list of types, tell me the index of the one I'm looking for. That you'll have to not write a full expression, and if const expert will turn out to be very useful in that uh, pursuit. All right. What's the difference here? If const expert versus concepts. How do they relate to one another? Short story, they don't. They're both about templates. That's about as far as it goes. If const expert is for template branches, concepts are about template constraints. These are the types that are allowed to be used with this function. Two different things. Now, there's some good news here. You can implement if const expert today. You can take home an implementation, try it out, use it at home. No more fancy wizard's hats for you. And you can do it to do cool things. So maybe this will help if you didn't understand the instantiation problem from before. I've got a struct widget on the top right. It has a single method, foo. I create one on the top left, and I call this function foobar. And foobar is magic. What it does is it says, does the type have a foo function? Does widget have a function called foo? And if it does, and only if it does, it calls foo. And then it asks, does it have a bar function? And if and only if it has a bar function, we call bar. We introspect. We ask, is this type capable of calling foo? Is this type capable of calling bar? And then we act on that information. And importantly, x.bar makes no sense for a widget. But this will compile because the if statement will prevent that code block from being instantiated. That's the difference between if const expr and if. That's the magic sauce. All right, how do we implement it? I'm going to do it in one slide. At the top left, I've got an example of how you'd use it that's just for reference. The right side is the first piece of the implementation. We've talked about template branching. We said there is a way to do this before C17. And so that's how we're going to implement it. That's where we're going to build up from. I have partial template specialization. So I have a base case. In my base case, my default case, I say we have this Boolean, and I'm going to accept a function, any function type. And I'm not going to call it. That's ultimately going to be the case where the condition is false. I have a pattern match. I say, if the condition was true, if the pattern is true and any function, then I am going to call the function. Now, I have a dummy argument there. That probably doesn't make sense. I'll explain it in a little bit. But so far, big difference is we say, if the condition is false, don't call the function. If the condition is true, do call the function. Part two, I have a call if function. And all that does, the only purpose it serves, is to deduce the type of f. We deduce the type of f, we forward on to the struct. That's the second piece. The last part is a macro, sorry. We accept a condition in the code block, and we formulate it all together. So we say call if, we pass the condition, and we have a lambda. The lambda accepts all of the things by reference and scope, because an if statement has access to everything outside of it. So reference is what we want. Auto is probably confusing, and I'll explain in a second. And then the code block, that thing you had in the curly braces. So why auto? What are we doing here? What's going on? And to explain that, I need to talk about how lambdas are implemented. So lambdas lower. Again, remember that word. We rewrite some syntactic sugar as a struct that contains an overload of the function call operator. And if my, my lambda here said int x, it would be the function call operator that began with int x. And that's all it is. Now, if I did write the, the long form, if I did write a functor by hand, one thing that we uh, can do with the functor in C11, but not the lambda, is say, hey, the function call operator is templated. It'll accept any type. And so now we have this new syntax where we say auto in C14. Auto in the context of a lambda means this can be any type. This is a templated type. And here I said auto, and I didn't give it a name. I said, it's any type, and by the way, I don't care about the value. I don't care about the name of the variable, because I'm not going to use it. So what am I doing? Why am I passing a bool? What's with the auto? The trick here, the reason that that's there, is we made this function a template. And the nice thing about a template is that it only checks if it is syntactically valid until you instantiate it. It is only when you instantiate that template that it says, can you actually perform this operation? And that's the trick behind x.bar there. 
I want it to look like a function call. It has to look like valid C++. But we don't check whether or not x.bar is a thing you can do unless that template is instantiated. And by making that auto, by making that parameter auto, we say the lambda is a template, and it is not instantiated until we call it. And I can give it anything. I gave it a bool. You could give it an int. You could give it a standard string. You could give it a vector. Any type you want. The only thing that matters is that we do not instantiate that template until we actually want to call it. If const expert in C++14. Now, a uh, couple caveats. There's actually another speaker at this conference, Vittorio. He gave a talk yesterday, and there's a version of that that's been recorded. He has a better version of this, one that doesn't fit on a slide. It has nicer syntax. It doesn't use a macro. And my understanding is that it's actually more correct. So for me, this worked in all the places I wanted to. But if you're interested in this, if you want to take home a closer to production quality version of this, look up his talk. All right, so we have this design by introspection stuff where we say, am I capable of doing this? If so, then do it. That's pretty cool. And in a minute, I'm going to show you a place where the standard library has done this for years. GCC, Clang, Visual Studio, they all do an optimization by asking, is my type capable of something? And acting on that information. Before I do, though, this has foo business, this thing where I ask, is this function or is my type capable of calling a foo method? I want to just give you a slide that has that. I'm not going to talk about it too much. Here it is. If you want to take a picture, great. If you want a full talk on this, there was a guy uh, named Sasha at NDC Oslo this year. He did a great talk explaining this. Uh, highlights, void t is an implementation detail. It's shipping in C++17. We again have this base case and uh, a different case that says, in an unevaluated context, could we potentially call foo and, and figure that all out? That's a rough outline of how it works. If you want more, go find Sasha's talk. All right. Here's where you've been getting this for years. Stood advance. This is a function that says, give me an iterator, any iterator, standard, boost, your code base, some custom iterator that isn't known ahead of time. Tell me to increment it by n times. For any iterator you gave me, the for loop there would work. All iterators will support that. But some, some random access iterators, say the one out of vector, can do it faster. They're like pointers. You can add arbitrary numbers to them. They will go n positions at constant time. And so you can do a fast path. And your standard library implementer does this with advance. They do this with things like copy n. They do this with fill. You don't need things like mem copy and mem set anymore, because your standard libraries are smart. And what we're doing here is we're we're introspecting. Is my iterator capable of the fast path? Is it capable of the interface random access iterator? And if so, we do that version, and otherwise we do the other. Now, there's this thing I haven't explained on the slide, this standard iterator traits. And what that is is it's a compile time map operation. We say take the set of all iterators, again, any of them, and we map them onto a small set of types, these tag types. There's a, a forward iterator tag, a bidirectional iterator tag, a random access iterator tag. And they're just empty types that say, what is the set of powers that this iterator has? And you can compare. You can say, is the tag that we got for this iterator the random access iterator tag? Is it capable of that operation? And if it is, do it. And that's the magic. And it's easier in C17 with if const expert. That's really what we got, is we made it easier. You can do this beforehand. It's easier now. So what have we talked about? We talked about string view. String view is awesome because it is faster. You get a free perf win. And this is a clean interface. It works with all the standard algorithms. And it avoids that nasty static initialization order fiasco. We've got operator dot on the horizon. We'll probably get something like it. Maybe not what you've seen in the slides here today, but you should be able to do those particular tasks. It's fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Just a brain exercise. And the last one, if const expert, makes template branching easier. It's designed to take off our wizard's hats and just do that thing we learned right away. Now, one thing I began this talk with that I, that I forgot to mention is I said you could use string view today. And I don't just mean that you could grab a new version of the compiler and start using it, although I bet you can. Uh, there's actually implementations out there. I, I believe there might be one uh, in the 
core guidelines library. Somebody was telling me that. Uh, if not, Facebook has an open source library called Folly. There's something in there called String Piece, which is almost exactly that. So you can use that today. You can start getting those benefits today. And with that, I'm Mark Isaacson. Thanks for coming. You can find this and other talks on my blog. Do we have questions? Um, I, I have a question and a request. Yes. Uh, the question is, what do you think about the fact that string view is read-only? What do I think about the fact that string view is read-only? Um, I think that that's fine for probably the same reason that const string reference is also read-only. So any place where you'd use that, string view is just as applicable, but you get some extra wins because there's less conversions that you have to do, uh, less allocations and stuff like that. Uh, I don't mind that it is essentially const. OK. Uh, and the request is um, operator dot is not universally uh, appreciated. <laughs> and if you could somehow let the committee know how cool it is, um, it would help you get it. Yeah, uh, I actually have plans. I started implementing operator dot in Clang, and I got part of the way through, and I, I lost a little bit of momentum. But it is my hope to someday be able to show up to the standard with an implementation of either operator dot or the competing proposal or both, uh, and be able to say, this is, in practice, why they're good, why they're bad, so and send, figure send it out. Send me an email. I have another half implementation. Oh, very good. <laughs> Uh, thanks, great talk. Uh, just Thank you. Would you really actually recommend to replace all the consting reference by StringView? Because basically you will, you will copy actually, I mean StringView is a pointer plus actually the size, or maybe two pointers actually beginning on end, where actually in the other case you would only copy the pointer actually, right? I mean reference. Uh, that's actually a good thought. I hadn't thought about the, the extra cost of copying the length. Um, I, I just hadn't considered that. So you might be right. The, the real downside, I think, with doing it is going to come from the, uh, the case where you ultimately do need to call some third-party code that you can't modify, and that gets in the way. I think that that's going to be the bigger one, but uh, the compiler might actually do a good job of saying, hey, I, I can figure out I don't need to copy this and, and handle that case. So maybe I'm not sure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Uh, just a small detailed question on how the operator lowering works. So you said that bounded int plus equal int, of course, works. That's what you want. Like, can we do the opposite? Does it always also work with implicit conversion operators and all other operators? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And I actually don't have the answer for you. I, I think that that should be something addressed by a paper that ultimately would get accepted but I don't have the answer for you off the top of my head. Maybe, maybe Bjarne would know. I see a hand. What's your gut feeling? What, should it be implicit in that case, like um, int plus equal bounded int? I, I would actually like to hear what Bjarne has to say. It's a, he had a hand up. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hi. On you, so most of your first slides, you um, used const, const expert. Why you did this? Uh, could anything be more cons than con expo? Yeah, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, in C11, const expert implied const. In C14, it does not. Const expert does not mean const. It means that it is, it is initialized at compile time. That is all it means. And so you do need that extra const on there to say, this is immutable, don't change this. So it's initialized at compile time, but it's changeable at runtime? Yes. Or, well, if it's only const expert, yes. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, the string view is, I, I think it's really great to try to avoid the static initialization fiasco, but it's only for strings. I would like to know if it's, there is any work towards other types, or if it's even possible to do for other types. Yeah, um, there is... A template view something. Yeah. So I know that there is an array view, 
uh, and I, I imagine maybe that could help with a case like that as well. In general, the problem of static initialization order fiasco is a very hard one. Uh, and internally at, at Facebook, we've spent a lot of hours kind of cleaning up all of that tech debt. And in general, it's just hard. Uh, I don't know that there's a silver bullet for this one. For strings, we have an answer. For other types, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, and it sounds like we might have... Uh, uh, sorry, I, I've worked in this field for a while. <laughs> and, and I'm a co-author of the operator dot. And uh, the guideline support library has a span which is like string view, but for arbitrary types and for read-write. And it doesn't address the, um, the order of static initialization problem. Our solution to that is don't do complicated stuff and detect it if you do. Yeah. I've got a question uh, concerning the operator dot. Does it only bring the operators from the wrapped element to the outside or also any uh, member functions? Uh, yeah, so it, it would bring member functions as well. It would also bring data members. Uh, one thing that the current proposal does not bring into the uh, wrapper is if I was wrapping a vector, for example, it would not let me write uh, bounded in colon colon value type, or bounded vector rather. Bounded vector colon colon value type would not work. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you all very much. <laughs>